Hey, welcome back. Exam prep, lesson three, part one. Sorry there's been a delay. Um, I've been busy writing these, so... Uh, so I could get ahead of, of where we were trying to go. Um, so, lesson three only has one part, part one. Um, and, as I said earlier, there's... Uh, the, the, the first part of every lesson is, is generally quite a big one. Um, but we'll get there. Uh, listen, I really want to say uh, hi to Alan Thompson and the gang out there um, up in the North Island. Uh, listen, thanks very much for the amazing positive feedback. It makes it all worthwhile. And I'm really sorry that I haven't been doing the videos. I've been trying to, to write the curriculum. So please bear with me. Um, I know that there's, uh, you know, you've, you've got your exam schedule and everything else. I'm trying to keep up, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> we all got to work and earn money at the same time to be able to pay for this amazing hobby too. Um, so listen, thanks, thanks for your patience. I'm getting there. Uh, please bear with me, and I do apologise for the uh, for the late kick off on this. So let's get in. General operating and flight rules. Uh, another wonderfully boring and obnoxious topic, but one of the things that we so desperately need to know. So. Um, the CIA expect us to, to to truly understand uh, general operating requirements, and one of the things that we will be tested on is the ability to be able to describe the requirements of passengers to comply with instructions and commands under CAR 91. Uh, 91.5 is the compliance with cruise instructions and commands, and in its simplest form, a passenger shall comply with any commands given to them by the pilot in command pursuant lovely legal term, to 91203. And 91203 states, uh, under the heading of authority of a pilot in command, that each pilot in command of an aircraft shall give any commands necessary for the safety of the aircraft and of the persons and property carried on the aircraft, including disembarking or refusing of carriage. Uh, this is broken into two pieces. One, any person who appears to be under the influence of alcohol or any drug where, in the opinion of the pilot in command, the carriage is likely to endanger the aircraft or its occupants. And two, any person or any part of the cargo which, in the opinion of the PIC, is likely to endanger the aircraft or its occupants. Now, roughly broken down, <coughs> this means that under CAR 91 Section 5, it states that a passenger must comply with any and technically all commands the pilot in command gives to them under Part 91203. And 91203 says that the pilot in command must give the commands necessary to ensure the safety of the aircraft, people and property carried on board. This includes the embarkation and dis disbarkation or the refusal of carriage of anyone who appears to be under the influence of alcohol or drugs and is likely to endanger the aircraft, the crew or the persons on board. Now the pilot in command can also disembark or refuse any other person or cargo which in his or her opinion, and that's a key, key term here, in his or her opinion is likely to endanger the aircraft or the person on board. Continuation 91125 uh, is under the simulated instrument flight. And it says that, except as provided in paragraph B, no person may operate an aircraft in simulated instrument flight unless, one, the aircraft has two pilot stations and one pilot station is occupied by a safety pilot who is the holder of a current PPL. And, two, the safety pilot has... 1. Adequate vision forward and to and each side of the aircraft. Now, uh, put yourself in that position. Uh, you've got your foggles on, um, but you've got the, the instructor sitting to your right who has a clear and unrestricted view of the airspace. Um, 2. A competent observer to, adv uh, to adequately su supplement the vision of the safety pilot and the aircraft is equipped with the following. Fully functional dual controls. Very important. Should you suddenly, or should the safety pilot suddenly see uh, a rather large and unfriendly aircraft bearing down on your your vector, then uh, he needs to be able to do something to get us out of the way. Uh, um, uh, 
fully functional dual controls, pitch, roll, yaw, and engine power controls that can be operated from either pilot station. So he must have the means to be able to, in an emergency, divert and take control of that aircraft to be able to uh, deviate away from an imminent danger. Um, B, a person may operate an aircraft in simulated instrument flight that does not comply with the paragraph A3 if the simulated flight is performed outside control airspace. Uh, so that, that's, that's general aviation airspace or... or uh, G airspace. And two, uh, the means of simulating instrument flight can be removed rapidly by the pilot in command. Um, so, you know, if you're equipped with second sight um, and suddenly you can rip off the foggles or flick a switch and your foggles have gone and you can see perfectly. Now, what that means is to operate an aircraft in simulated instrument flight, the aircraft has to have two pilot stations equipped with dual controls or pitch, roll, yaw, and engine power controls that can be operated from either side or either station. Uh, a safety pilot must be on board uh, that has a current PPL, at least the minimum entry requirement, uh, adequate vision to ensure flight safety, or a second person to supplement that uh, safety pilot's vision. <coughs> Please excuse me. Uh, paragraph B refers to someone carrying out simulated flight in an aircraft that does not have dual flight controls or pitch, roll, yaw, and engine power controls. You may still carry out simulated instrument flight outside of control airspace if you can remove the way in which you are simulating, i.e. foggles can be removed quickly, um, if you're taping a newspaper over the window, uh, it would not be able to rem be removed as quickly and therefore uh, it has a distinct inherent risk to it. Uh, but the safety uh, pilot still needs to be carried. Cool. Um, 4.36, uh, we are expected to be able to state the requirements of a pilot in command with respect to the safe operation of an aircraft under CAR 91. Uh, 91201 is the safety of an aircraft. Uh, and that is, a pilot in command of an aircraft must... One, before operating the aircraft, be satisfied that the aircraft is airworthy and in a condition for safe flight after, one, the document, uh, the documents required under 91 have been inspected, and two, the aircraft has been inspected, so that's your pre-flight. And number two, during the flight, ensure that the safe operation of the aircraft and the safety of its occupants, and three, on completion of the inspection, uh, inspections required by paragraph one and on completion of the flight uh, record in a technical log or other equivalent documentation acceptable to the director of uh, any aircraft defects that are identified by the crew during the inspections that are carried out during the flight so this means note that uh, PIC uh, one of the many responsibilities is ensuring safety and to do that before the flight, uh, your responsibility is to check the five documents. Remember we said that there's always five, not four, not six, and, and you may see variations on the, on the actual test itself that says you can have one, two, three, five, six, and seven, or you can have one, three, five, seven, and nine, but ultimately work it out. There's five documents, nice and easy. Uh, during the flight... Um, by operating the aircraft safely and keeping your passengers safe. So whenever you get a question around this, remember that it's, it's, it's a very, very focused safety issue. So if you want to eliminate two out of the four answers, look for the safety concerns. Um, and if you notice any defects prior to the flight or in flight, these must be recorded in the technical log so that some poor unsuspecting uh, PPL trainee coming along can pick up that log and go, eh, this hasn't actually been looked at or signed off by the engineer yet, so I can't fly this aircraft. Um, so that that's the rationale behind it. It makes sense. Think about it logically when you're actually sitting the exam. 4.38. Uh, we are expected to be able to describe the authority of a pilot in command under CAR 91. And 91.203 covers the authority of the pilot in command. And it says that each pilot in command of an aircraft shall give 
any commands necessary for the safety of the aircraft and of persons and property carried on that aircraft, including disembarking or refusal of carriage of any of the following. One, any person who appears to be under the influence of alcohol or any drug where, in the opinion of the PIC, the carriage is likely to endanger the aircraft or the occupants. And two, any person or any part of the cargo which, in the opinion of the pilot in command, is likely to endanger the aircraft or its occupants. Meaning, 91203 says that the pilot in command must give the commands necessary to ensure the safety of the aircraft, people and property carried on board. Now, this is not saying this is the scope and the remit of, of control that the PIC has. It's saying that the pilot in command must give the commands necessary to ensure. So you've got to kind of step up there, stick your chest out and say, no, this is, this, in, in my opinion, is, is, is going to be uh, restrictive to the safety of the, uh, of the passengers, cargo or crew. All right? Um, now, this includes disembarking or refusing anyone who appears to be under the influence of alcohol or drugs and, as a result of that, is likely to endanger the aircraft or the persons on board. The pilot in command can also disembark or refuse any other person or cargo which, in his or her opinion, is likely to endanger the aircraft or the persons on board. 4.30.10. We are expected to be able to state the requirements for crew occupation of seats and wearing safety belts under CAR 91. Uh, now, 91205 uh, covers the crew members at stations. And it states that under A, each crew member on duty during takeoff and landing in an aircraft other than in a balloon shall, one, be at their crew member's station unless their absence is necessary to perform the duties in connection or conjunction with the operation of the aircraft, and two, have their safety belts fastened while at a crew member station. So I'm going to go back to this really quickly. Um, because I, I've heard mention of a, a couple of uh, really interesting questions um, that have that have come up on on the exam, um, and this is this is pertaining to a crew member that is a crew member but not on duty. So watch out for this one. So understanding that ninety one twenty five under the crew members at stations section says. Each crew member on duty during takeoff and landing in an aircraft other than the balloon shall carry on these particular tasks has to be on duty. All right, so you could potentially have an off duty crew member on your plane. Does does the, 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 the same security and observational requirements uh, still stand? Not so much. It's more around if they're off duty and in uniform and they're, 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 they're doing various things like uh, drinking and everything else. Remember, they're off duty. We are questioned based on each crew member on... I should have underlined that. On duty. Anyway, so um, B, each crew member on duty, on duty during takeoff and landing in an aircraft other than in a balloon shall have their shoulder harnesses fastened while at their crew member station unless one unless the seat at the crew member station is not equipped with a shoulder harness or two the crew member would be unable to perform their duties with the shoulder harnesses fastened again please remember that that's a, a an interesting question points that you want to carry away from that is a crew member on duty <coughs> and the crew member would be unable the on duty crew member would be unable to perform their duties with the shoulder harnesses fastened so again uh, demystified this means crew members uh, sorry crew requirements unless you are in a hot air balloon you must be at your station i.e. the seat um, with your seat belt and shoulder harness fastened for takeoff and landings. But if that station is unequipped with the shoulder harness, or the uh, uh, or, or a shoulder harness would restrict 
your ability to perform the duties that you've been assigned, you don't have to worry. 4.32, uh, we are expected to be able to state the requirements for the occupation of seats and wearing of restraints under car 91. Uh, and we have a lovely section, 91207, which covers that, the occupation of seats and wearing of restraints. Oh, sorry. Uh, the pilot in command of an aircraft must require each passenger to occupy a seat or berth and to fasten their safety belt, restraining belts, or, if equipped, shoulder harness or single diagonal shoulder belt. Under these conditions, one, during each takeoff and landing, two, when the aircraft is flying at a height of less than 1,000 feet above the surface, three, at other times when the PIC considers it necessary for their safety, example, turbulence, um, four, during aerobatic flight, and five, at all times in an open cockpit aircraft for very obvious reasons. Um, B. A pilot in command of an aircraft may permit a passenger to unfasten a shoulder harness or single diagonal shoulder belt during, one, during takeoff and landing, uh, and two, when the aircraft is flying at a height of less than 1,500, if the pilot in command is satisfied that such action is necessary, is necessary, for the passenger's performance of essential function associated with the purpose of that flight. Uh, under C, uh, a pilot in command of an aircraft must require each passenger to place their seat in the takeoff and landing configuration during takeoff and landings. Uh, takeoff configuration, if you're unfamiliar with it, is the seat right in the upward and forward position. So it's upright, can't be leaning back, forward as in secured, nice and stationary. So that should you fly into the ground like a dart, you've got some kind of support there. Um, D, paragraphs A1, 2 and 3 do not apply to children under 4 years of age. If the, now this is important, if the child, one, is held by an adult who is occupying a seat or berth, and the child is secured, remember that, is secured by a safety belt attached to the adult's safety belt. The reason that I want to make emphasis on that is because, again, I was speaking to someone who recently sat the test, and one of the questions was that a children under, a, a child under four, do they have to occupy their own seat? Um, and the answer was was variations of um, yes, they do. Uh, no, they don't. They can be carried by the, the the parent or guardian. No, they can be carried by the parent or guardian if there is a shoulder, uh, if there is a, a, a secure device attaching them to the the, the, the parent or guardian. Um, or B, no, uh, you can just let them crawl around the cockpit just because it's fun. Um, now, the the individual that I was talking to had marked the fact that if, if the child was held uh, by the parent or guardian, and that was wrong, uh, and it's very obvious why, because the child has to be secured by a safety belt attached to the adult's safety belt. All right, uh, so we move on. Um, uh, or, alternatively, occupies a seat equipped with a child restraint system if the child does not exceed the specific weight limit for that system and is accompanied by a parent, guardian, or by an attendant designated by the child's parents or guardian to attend to the safety of the child during the flight. An E paragraph A does not apply to passengers carried in balloons or engaged in parachute operations because, well, that would be quite entertaining. Now, this means that uh, passenger requirements, unless in a balloon or parachuting, passengers are required to occupy a seat or berth, i.e. cannot be standing, free-floating, or just leaning against anything that they like, um, and fasten their seat belt and shoulder harness, if equipped, for takeoff, landing, and aerobatic flight, for any situation where you are flying below 1,000 feet, 
when the pilot in command considers it necessary in very much in an oak open cockpit. Uh, the shoulder harness does not have to be worn during takeoff, landing and flights below a thousand feet. If the PIC is satisfied that it needs to be off for the passenger to perform an essential function associated with the purpose of that flight, i.e. Uh, engineering checking f uh, uh, engineering check flight, uh, the engineer does not have to wear a shoulder harness if it inhibits the engineer from carrying out the checks that he needs to do to be able to certify that flight. Um, if the check does not have to be carried out during takeoff, landing, or below a thousand feet, the engineer must wear the shoulder harness. And again, that is a derivative from some of those really quirky little questions that are out there. Keep an eye on those. Uh, state the requirements for the use of oxygen equipment under car 91. And we are very lucky in the fact that 91209 covers the use of oxygen equipment. And it states that A. A pilot in command of an unpressurized aircraft must, during any time that the aircraft is being operated above 13,000 feet above mean sea level, and during any period of more than 30 minutes that the aircraft is being operated between 10,000 feet and up to and including 13,000 feet above mean sea level, it is a requirement that each crew member and each passenger to use supplemental oxygen. And two, each crew member to use portable oxygen equipment, including regulator and attached oxygen mark. That mask for any duty required, uh, requiring movement from their usual station. So if it's not in their normal station, they need to be able to uh, to, to be supplied with uh, a portable way of being able to consume oxygen or supplemental. B. A pilot in command of a pressurized aircraft must one during any time the cabin pressure altitude is above ten thousand feet above mean sea level, clue there is the cabin pressure altitude. Not the actual altitude above mean sea level, but the cabin pressure altitude is above 10,000 feet MSL. Require one, each crew member to use supplemental oxygen, and two, each crew member to use portable oxygen equipment including a regulator and attached oxygen mask for any duty requiring movement from their usual station where it would be provided normally. And two, during any time the aircraft is being operated from flight level 350 up to and including flight level 410 require one, a pilot at a pilot station to wear and use an oxygen mask that either supplies supplemental at all times, or automatically supplies supplemental oxygen whenever the cabin pressure, uh, cabin pressure altitude exceeds 13,000 feet AMSL, or two, two pilots to be at their pilot stations and each pilot to have access to an oxygen mask that can be placed on the face and supplying oxygen within five seconds. And of course there's more, and three, during any time the aircraft is being operated above flight level 410, require one pilot at one pilot station to wear and use a demand oxygen mask at all times. Uh, C covers off the a pilot in command of a pressurized aircraft must, following pressurization failure, require each passenger to use and consume supplemental oxygen during any time that the cabin pressure is above 14,000 feet AMSL, that's cabin pressure and not actual pressure, uh, unless the aircraft can descend to 14,000 feet AMSL or below within four minutes. Meaning, if you're operating a non-pressurized aircraft above 13,000 feet AMSL or above 10,000 feet AMSL for more than 30 minutes, you and all of your passengers must be using supplemental oxygen. And if you are required to move around on board the aircraft with this oxygen, it must be portable. You cannot go from one to the other to the other to, to actually do your part. It must be portable. Um, if operating a pressurized aircraft and the cabin altitude exceeds 
10,000 feet AMSL, all crew members, not passengers, must use supplemental oxygen, and this must be portable if the crew has to move about the aircraft, i.e. a flight attendant. If a pressurized aircraft is flying above flight level 350, there are additional and extra requirements. We are also expected to know uh, and they have the ability to state the requirements for briefing passengers prior to flight under car 91. And thankfully 91211 gives us the passenger briefing part of the law. And it states, A, a person operating an aircraft carrying passengers must ensure that each passenger has been briefed on the following subjects. One, conditions under which smoking is permitted. Generally, right the way across the world at the moment, it is not permitted. Two, the applicable requirements specified by 91.121 and 91.207 and three, the location and means of operating the passenger entry doors and emergency exits and when required to be carried by this part. One, the location of the survival and emergency equipment for passenger use. Two, the use of flotation equipment required under 91.525 for flight over water. Three, the normal and emergency use of oxygen equipment installed in the aircraft for passenger use. Also, we need to cover off the procedures in case of an emergency landing, uh, and we also need to cover off the use of portable electronic devices in accordance with 91.7, roughly meaning if it's an IFR flight. B, the briefing required under paragraph A must be given by a pilot in command, a member of the crew, a person nominated by the operator or by a recorded presentation as with all flights uh, commercial flights in these days two must for flights above flight level 250 include a demonstration on the use of supplemental oxygen equipment three must include a demonstration on the use of life preservers when required to be carried by this part four must include a statement as appropriate that civil aviation rules require passengers compliance with lighted passenger signs and crew member instructions and may be supplemented by printed cards for the use of each passenger containing one diagrams and methods of operation of the emergency exits and two other instructions necessary for the use of emergency equipment intended for the use by passengers and lastly, if not required, uh, sorry, and lastly, is not required if the PIC determines that all passengers are familiar with the contents of the briefing. Qantas, Cathay Pacific, Air New Zealand, all of these companies do not presume that all passengers are familiar with the content as you would have seen from the briefing. But... PICs do have a get a chill free card here. If you are regularly taking the same people up, you are not required if you are the PIC um, that you need to give your passengers a briefing if you truly believe that they are familiar with the contents of the briefing of that particular aircraft, destination, um, emergency equipment, oxygen, life flotation devices, etc. Uh, but remember that, because that is a, a, a key little question that keeps coming up. Um, we also need to be able to state the requirements for briefing passengers prior to flight CR. Oh, no, it's the same one. Um, so, C, where printed cards are used in accordance with paragraph B5, the operator must place them in convenient locations on the aircraft for use for each passenger and ensure that they contain information that is pertinent only to the type and model of the aircraft on which they are carried. Meaning, remember that safety demonstrations on board commercial airlines part 91211 is the requirement to this to be given to passengers on board. 
passengers must be briefed on smoking conditions, stowage of tray tables and video screens, the wearing of seat belts, location of emergency exits, any survival or emergency equipment, that is fire extinguishers, first aid kits, life jackets, life rafts, uh, normal and emergency oxygen use, the procedures in an emergency landing, including ditching, um, the use of portable electronic devices, uh, a statement must be made saying that the passengers have to comply with the lighted signs and the crew instructions. Uh, this briefing must be given by the PIC, another member of the crew, a person nominated by the operator, uh, or by a recorded presentation. Um, life jackets and oxygen use, etc. only have to be briefed if they're required to be on board of your flight. Um, briefing cards must be placed in convenient locations for each passenger and only contain information that is relevant for the type and model of the aircraft they're flying in. Um, and note, a briefing is not required if the pilot in command is satisfied that the passengers are familiar with the, uh, familiar with the contents of the briefing. That is in bold for a reason. There are variations of questions out there with this as a trick answer. Remember, yes, they all have to comply under the various parts of Part 91, 211, Part 91, 121, etc, etc, etc. But, a briefing is not required if the pilot in command is satisfied that the passengers are familiar with the contents of the briefing. We are also expected to be able to state the requirements for familiarity with operating limitations and emergency equipment under CAR 91. And under CAR 91 219, familiarity with operating limitations and emergency equipment as if by magic is a section here. And it states, each pilot of an aircraft shall, before beginning a flight, be familiar with the following. The aircraft flight manual for the aircraft, any place cards, listings, instrument markings, or any combination thereof containing any operating limitation prescribed for that aircraft by the manufacturer or the director, the emergency equipment installed on an aircraft, uh, and which crew member is assigned to operate that emergency equipment, and the procedures to be followed for the use of emergency equipment in that particular emergency situation. Meaning that a pilot of an aircraft, a PIC or co-pilot, must be familiar with the following before flight. The flight manual, place cards, listings, instrument markings which contain limitations, emergency equipment installed on the aircraft and who will operate that equipment in that emergency and the procedures to be followed for the use of the emergency equipment in that specific emergency. 43020 we are expected to state the requirements for carrying appropriate aeronautical publications and charts in flight and 91221 covers the flying equipment and operating information. And it states that, A, a pilot in command of an aircraft must ensure that the following equipment and information in current and appropriate form is accessible to every flight crew member of the aircraft. Appropriate aeronautical charts and uh, if, if flying under IFR operations, every appropriate navigational en route terminal area approach and instrument approach and departure charts are available. This means that a PIC must ensure that charts are current and accessible to every flight crew member. This would be VNC, flying VFR, and if flying IFR, all charts including the IIPs, Volume 2 and 3, must be carried. 4.30.22, we are required to state the requirements for operating on and in the vicinity of an aerodrome under CAR 91. Luckily, CAR 91223 covers the operating on and in the vicinity of an aerodrome. And it states that A, except as provided in paragraph B, 
a pilot of an aeroplane operating on or in the vicinity of an aerodrome must 1. Observe other aerodrome traffic for the purpose of avoiding collisions and 2. Unless otherwise authorised or instructed by ATC conform with or avoid the aerodrome traffic circuit formed by other aircraft. 3. Perform a left-hand aerodrome traffic circuit when approaching for a landing at and after takeoff from an aerodrome that is published in the AIP ANZ unless the following. The pilot is otherwise authorised or instructed by ATC or the IFR procedure published in the AIP ANZ uh, for the runway being used specif uh, specifies a right hand turn and approach for landings or takeoffs um, and that is being performed in accordance with the instrument procedure as listed in the AIP ANZ. 4. Perform a right hand aerodrome traffic circuit when approaching for a landing at and after takeoff from any aerodrome that is published in the IIPs if the details published in the AIPs for the aerodrome specifies a right hand aerodrome traffic circuit for the runway being used unless 1. The pilot is otherwise authorised or instructed by ATC or 2. The IFR procedure published in the IIP for the runway being used specifies a left hand turn and uh, the approach for landings or the takeoffs is being performed in accordance with the instrument procedures. Uh, five, unless otherwise authorised or instructed by ATC, uh, bearing in mind that those are not uh, gospel, uh, you can, if it is a risk to safety and your aircraft, uh, you can you can not comply with those and ask for a, an alternate set of instructions. Um, but ultimately, unless otherwise authorised or instructed by ATC, comply with any special aerodrome traffic rules prescribed in Part 93 for the aerodrome. B. Paragraphs A3, A4 and A5 do not apply to PIC of an aircraft operating an aviational event in accordance with Rule 9173. We've seen that, that rule. Um... And notwithstanding paragraphs A3 and A4, a PIC of an aircraft performing an agricultural aircraft operation from an aerodrome that is published in the AIP may make turns in any direction when approaching for a landing or after takeoff if the following is true. 1. The aerodrome does not have an aerodrome control service in attendance. 2. An aerodrome ground signal depicted in... F uh, I'll show you the figure later is depicted alongside the runway in use and three uh, there is no conflict with other aerodrome traffic and in the bottom right hand corner that's the little uh, image that we were talking about there so that's what's displayed when agricultural work is being carried out uh, so D subject to paragraphs B and C a pilot in command of a helicopter operating on or in the vicinity of any aerodrome must comply with paragraph A or avoid the aerodrome traffic circuit being used by an aeroplane operating on or in the vicinity of the aerodrome. Meaning, firstly, we need to understand what a left hand and a right hand circuit is. Uh, a left hand circuit is a circuit around the aerodrome in which the pilot makes left turns after takeoff to turn downwind, base, and then final. So if everything is turning left, then it's a left-hand circuit. Uh, if ultimately, when operating on or in the vicinity of an aerodrome, a pilot must avoid collisions with other aircraft. So, a listening watch and a a visual watch is imperative. And unless authorized by ATC, confirm with or avoid the traffic cir uh, circuit. Um, that other aircraft are using. Um, perform a left-hand circuit, meaning turns to the left, uh, unless authorised by ATC, or that the AIP specifically states that the circuit is a right-hand circuit at the aerodrome. 
Um, perform a right-hand circuit when stated in the IP unless authorised, alternatively, by ATC and IFR procedures, that you need to perform a left. Uh, these left or right-hand circuiting rules do not apply to aviation events or agricultural aircraft operations with a sign on the runway depicted below. Uh, these rules do not apply to the ag work when there is no aerodrome console, c control surface and the ground signal A, a big visible A, is depicted and displayed alongside the runway in use. There has to be no conflict with other traffic. We are also expected to be able to describe the standard overhead join procedure and state when it should be used under the AIP AD. And we've got a whole section on that. So 5.1 standard overhead join procedure and it says 5.1.1 the standard overhead join procedure which is depicted and we'll get to the picture in a minute. Um, should be followed at unattended aerodromes where no aerodrome control or AFIS is provided and at other aerodromes where a pilot is unfamiliar with the aerodrome or uncertain of circuit traffic. The standard overhead join procedure is a means of compliance with CAR 91223A2 which requires a pilot to conform with or avoid the aerodrome traffic circuit formed by other aircraft. This procedure is used to determine the runway in use and the position of traffic in order to sequence safely. It does not presume a right-of-way over existing circuit activity. Uh, 512 says the, the, the following procedures should be followed by pilots. A. If the aircraft is RTF equipped, advise aerodrome traffic of joining intentions. B. Approach the aerodrome by descending or climbing to 1500 feet or above aerodrome elevation if circuit height is other than a thousand feet is specified on the aerodrome charts join at not less than 500 feet above circuit height so when you fly in when you first come into that 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 ring of of, of fire and deceit you're joining across the top with 500 feet to spare above the current traffic circuit you're not going to bump into anything unless someone is wildly wrong. Um, so that is the specified joining altitude. You need to pass over the aerodrome, keeping it on your left in order to observe wind, circuit traffic and any ground signals displayed in order to establish the runway in use and sequence safely. If these cannot be fully ascertained, continue wings level to a point beyond the circuit area, approximately two nautical miles, and then turn, uh, and then turn left to return to the aerodrome at or above the joining height as specified in B to reassess the circuit direction. D. Once the circuit direction is established, make all subsequent turns in the direction of the traffic. I know that sounds obvious, but people have screwed that up. E. Once the condition in C is ascertained, cross to the non-traffic side and descend to circuit height. F. Turn a 90 degree across wind and pass sufficiently close to the upwind end of the runway to ensure that the aircraft is taking off. Any aircraft that are taking off can pass safely underneath you. And lastly, turn to join downwind leg of the traffic circuit at the point that ensures adequate spacing with any aircraft in the circuit ahead or behind. And there is a pretty graphic to cover that off. The standard overhead join procedure should be used at unattended aerodromes so you can determine which runway to land on and keeping clear of circuit traffic if you are unsure of the traffic's location. At controlled aerodromes, you must get ATC's clearance before carrying out a standard overhead join. When carrying out the standard overhead join, you do not have the right of way over other aircraft in the circuit. Just rub it in, I put that slide in twice. No, I didn't. It was an accident, but it makes it sound believable. 
We also need to be able to state and describe the application of the right of way rules. And we've kind of covered this off already, but we'll do it again. Uh, 91229 covers the right of way. A, a pilot of an aircraft, one, must, weather conditions permitting, regardless of whether the flight is performed under IFR or under VFR, maintain a visual lookout so as to see and avoid other aircraft. Two, that has the right of way, must maintain heading and speed, but is not relieved from the responsibilities of taking such action, including collision avoidance maneuvers based on the resolution advisories provided by ACAS that will best avert collisions. Three, that is obliged to give way to other aircraft, avoiding passing over under or in front of other aircraft unless passing well clear of the aircraft, taking into account the effect of wake turbulence. B, a pilot of an aircraft must, when approaching another aircraft head on or nearly so, alter heading to the right. C, a pilot of an aircraft that is converging at approximately the same altitude with another aircraft that is to the right must give way except that the pilot operating a power driven heavier than air aircraft must give way to airships, gliders, balloons, air, so anything lighter than it. An airship must give way to gliders and balloons. A glider must give way to balloons. A power-driven aircraft must give way to aircraft that are towing, other aircraft or objects, and all aircraft must give way to parachutes. A pilot of an aircraft that is overtaking another aircraft, if a turn is necessary to avoid said aircraft, alter heading to the right until overtaking aircraft is entirely passed and clear of the other aircraft. For the purpose of paragraph D, which is ultimately gorgeously confusing, an overtaking aircraft is an aircraft that approaches other from the, uh, sorry, either another from the rear or a line forming less than 70 degrees with the plane of symmetry of the latter. Again, beautiful legalese there. Uh, a pilot of an aircraft in flight or on the surface must give way to any aircraft that is on final approach to land or is landing. Makes sense. And when an aircraft is one or of two or more heavier than air aircraft approaching uh, an aerodrome for the purpose of landing, give way to the aircraft at the lower altitude. And three, not take advantage of right of way under subparagraph two to pass in front of another aircraft, which is on final approach to land or overtaking that aircraft. <sighs> Gee, a pilot of an aircraft must not take off if there is an apparent risk of collision with another aircraft. H, a pilot of an aircraft taxiing on the manoeuvring area of an aerodrome must give way to aircraft landing, taking off, or about to take off. Uh, two, when two aircraft are approaching head on, or nearly so, stop, or where practical, alter course to the right so as to keep well clear of the other aircraft. Uh, three, when two aircraft are on a converging course. Ooh give way to other aircrafts uh, on the pilot's right and four when overtaking another aircraft give way and keep well clear of the aircraft being overtaken uh, i a pilot of an aircraft must give way to any aircraft that is in distress that is a given uh, irrespective of any measurement so, each pilot of an aircraft on the water shall comply with the requirements of international regulations for preventing collisions at sea. So, it's basically a maritime law. All of that meaning, you must always maintain a visual look out to see and avoid other aircraft, no matter if you're flying VFR or IFR. Any aircraft that has right of way must maintain heading and speed. But if you think a collision may still happen, you must avoid that collision above all else. 
When avoiding another aircraft, you must not pass over or under the aircraft unless you have to. You should also not pass directly in front of the aircraft you are avoiding unless you have taken into account the effort of your wake turbulence on that aircraft. So, simply, who gives way to who? All aircraft must give way to distress aircraft. Powered aircraft, planes and helicopters, give way to other powered aircraft that are towing objects, airships, gliders and balloons. If you want a quick and easy way to remember